As chair of the House Ways and Means Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with House Rule 67 and the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to Executive Order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. This is a revenue work session. Please note that there are no physical location for members of the public to observe and listening contemporaneously to this meeting. However, in accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that all members of the committee and select legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during the meeting through the Zoom electronic meeting platform and the public has access to contemporaneously listen and if necessary, participate in this meeting by the Zoom platform or by telephone. All next necessary access information has been made available in the House calendar and through the electronic calendar on the general court website. The notice for this meeting complies with House Rules RSA 91-A. Anyone who has a problem accessing the meeting should call 271-3600 or email hcs at leg.state.nh.us. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be and rescheduled. I want to introduce the staff that are on the meeting, assisting us, Christopher Shea and Jennifer Floor. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Let's start the meeting by taking the roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state whether there is anyone in the room with them during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. Representative Bernstein, if you take the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Let's start the roll call with Representative Patrick Abrami. Chair, home in Stratum. My wife's in the house. house. Not in the Representative Mary Griffin. I don't see Mary. We are, we are trying to actively track her down, by the way. Good. Representative Owery. You're muted, Jordan. Yeah, there we go. At home, uh, wife is in the house. Representative Russ Ober. I don't see Russ. Russ Ober, Representative Fred Doucette. Representative Doucette. Representative Burstein is your clerk and I'm in beautiful Nottingham, New Hampshire in my home office. Representative Robert Elliott. Uh, here in Salem, New Hampshire, and my wife is in the house. Representative John Janigian. Here in Salem, New Hampshire, and my wife and daughter are in the house. Representative Herschel Nunez. Good morning. I'm home alone in Pelham, New Hampshire. Representative Tim Baxter. Thank you, Representative. I'm here alone in my house. Representative Walter Spilsbury. Here at home in Charlestown alone. Representative Paul Tudor. Here in Northwood alone. Representative Susan Almy. Here in my home in Lebanon alone. Representative Richard Ames. Here in Jeffrey in my home office alone. Representative Thomas Southworth. Here in Dover alone. Representative Dennis Malloy. Uh, thank you. Here in Greenland, home alone. Representative Thomas Schomburg. I'm in my truck uh, heading back to Wilmot. Representative Edith Tucker. I'm here in Randolph alone. Representative Jenny Gomarlo. Here in Swansea, husband in the house. Representative Tom Lofman. Representative Lofman. Representative Amanda Gorg. Here in Lee in my home office by myself. Representative Mary Hacken Phillips. Morning. I'm present this morning in my office at Concord, New Hampshire, and I am alone here. Representative James Murphy. Good morning. Here in Hanover, uh, my wife and daughter are in the house. Representative Norman Major. Here in Plasto, my wife is in the house. Thank you, everyone. There are 20 of us present. Four of us are not. Norm. Uh, Norm. Yes. Uh, uh, Fred, I spoke to Fred 15 minutes. Fred who said 15 minutes ago. He'll he'll be joining us. He he's uh, actually trying to reach out to uh, Mary. 
He's, he lives the closest to her. I hope Mary's okay. Yeah. Um, before we get started, I just want to go through some scheduling. Tomorrow on the 4th, we're scheduled to have public hearings starting at 9 o'clock. And then on Tuesday the 9th, we're scheduled to have revenue work session virtually as we have had starting at nine and then the same and then on the 10th we're scheduled to have regular ways and means work session virtually on all the bills that we heard and uh, we may do be doing some exactly uh, the work sessions will be on the bills that we will hear tomorrow and the ones that we heard on the 28th of January. On the 11th, there's public hearings on six or seven more bills. On the 16th, revenue work session commencing at 9 a.m. The 17th is public hearings on the remainder of our initial house bills. On the 18th, starting at nine o'clock, two hour meeting with the governor's budget director. And then follow that by revenue starting at 11 o'clock. And finally, on the Tuesday, the 23rd, revenue estimates starting at nine o'clock. And that's the schedule for the future. Any questions? Um, I talked to I talked to the uh, chief of staff, Aaron Gillet, about going completely virtual for our meetings because I haven't had one positive feedback relative to the hybrid meeting that we had the other day. The, the complaints was that if you weren't in the room, you couldn't be heard by the people joining virtually. And what does that mean? It means that, you know, we could be doing this for nothing because if, people, if committee members can't hear, then the public isn't going to be able to hear. Um, I've heard from those that have done the meetings completely virtual that they don't seem to have a problem with the voice so i'm trying to get a ruling from my leadership that we can do tomorrow's meeting completely virtual but i would recommend um well i probably shouldn't but i, I will anyway is that most of you that can do it virtually because the chances of being able to understand more would be better. I know that Congress last week when they met, they only had two in the room. The chairman and others were all virtual and they seemed to, seemed to work out. So uh, hopefully I'll have Better news, uh, but we, we have to have a hybrid meeting tomorrow, so I'll be there. I don't expect to have many others there, but do what you think is right. Any questions? What we plan on doing is um, when we do meet tomorrow. Uh, Norm, I do have my hand up. Okay, I wasn't looking at the hands yet, <laughs> but uh, go ahead, Tom. Um, I appreciate the schedule way ahead. The work sessions generally will go from nine to 12. Do you expect them also to go a certain amount of time in the afternoon? If needed. Okay, but it's probably not like it's gonna go to three or something like that. It depends on you guys. Oh, okay. But where you have so many work schedules planned out, yeah, okay. Now on those work schedules, what's also gonna happen 
is that we're making arrangements to um, have um, somebody that um, represented uh, suggested he gave us three names of uh, uh, representing from the medical to talk about the uh, vaccine and the COVID-19. About COVID-19. COVID what's that? About COVID-19. Yes. Yeah. And then um, what's the possibility that uh, things are going to improve or get worse? And what do they think? We need to understand that because that will greatly affect what we think revenues are going to do. So I'm working to make that part of the work sessions. Also, uh, it was one of the main areas I, I can't remember right now. Representative Major, yes. this is Chris. Chris. Um, so I reached out to Dr. Chan through John Williams at Department of Health and Human Services this morning to try to arrange a time for him to come talk to the committee Good. Um, about the pandemic and the vaccinations and everything else that you may have questions about. I've also reached out to the um, Restaurant and Lodging Association. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Um, I have not heard back from either one of those yet, but once I do, I'm trying to schedule them on those days that you just mentioned that you would be doing work the 9th, 16th, or the 18th after the governor's budget director comes in. So once I have confirmation, I will let the committee know. So what was brought up yesterday, uh, suggestions on who we would like to hear from, we're working on that to make that happen. Uh, in addition, I was trying to get somebody from the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston to present the economic update for national New England and New Hampshire at our January meetings, but there was a blackout. They, they don't do that up for a period from like the 8th of January to the 28th. So I'm going to try to sneak them in on one of these work sessions to get an update on the uh, what's happening what they feel is, is happening relative to the economy nationally, New England and New Hampshire. And then uh, what, will, what do they feel will happen if we solve the, um, the vaccine problem and things go well with the vaccinations? And what do they feel will happen if it doesn't go well with the vaccination or something else happens? So we need to understand what those extremes might be from, from say somebody from the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. So hopefully we'll, we can work that in before we do our revenue estimates on the 23rd. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Oh, are you saying we would vote on the 23rd and not on the 19th? Because if we hear important information on the 18th, that would be too late for us to really absorb it. If we, I purposely put some time between what we heard on the 18th which is on a Thursday, to give us some time to do our own research and be prepared on the 23rd, which is the following Tuesday. Oh, thank you. You hadn't mentioned the 23rd yet. You mentioned the 19th, which I, is a Friday. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Notes that you had. He did, he did mention it. Yeah. I don't think he said anything for fr for Friday the 19th, did you? He had 23rd. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, I heard that somehow. The 23rd is a lot better. I've and stayed away from Mondays and Fridays and only use those as a backup. And also be able to use those maybe as caucuses. I'm planning to have a republic. 
Republican caucus this afternoon at four o'clock. And I just sent the email out. Hopefully, it got out okay. Um, because no, I got I got one other thing, uh, Norm. One other thing that's related to this to the revenues. You know, we have a House session on the twenty fourth and twenty fifth. It's my understanding. Yes. Do we need to have a House resolution ready for that? No. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. No. I need to, I need to work that out with Ken Weiler. Right. Okay. That's I just want to make sure. You know, finance will will get out of business after the 17th, after the governor presents his budget. And the first blush will be the 23rd. And then anything happens after that, we'll come back and revisit those revenues. But so Norm, we will exact a number of bills in time to make it into the 24th and 25th? Oh, yes. Uh, okay. What I plan to do is that on tomorrow, when we have those other seven public hearings, mm -hmm. if we have any free time, that is, hold on one second. I have one, two, three, four. There's, there's four bills I want to exact, and I've gone over these with Susan, and Susan has gone over those with her caucus, and mm -hmm. I've gone over those with my caucus, but I'm going to go over them again today with my caucus. And it seems that both caucuses are lined up on four of the bills, so we must well get those out. We need to get the early mm -hmm. bill out, which is 533. So uh, bear with me tomorrow if we get an extra 15 minutes in between hearings tomorrow, we'll, we'll do an exact session. And then after the last bill, we'll do the, if, the, if we had an exact those four, we'll work on that. Thank you. And I may have missed it. I apologize. But what did someone say what's happening on the 24th and 25th? Uh, 20, well, on the I mean, 24th, where are we going and all that? On the 24th and 25th, in our caucus, they said, be prepared on the, for a session on the 24th and 25th. And they're trying to work out the details. Okay. And so I would expect that we will have a caucus. We need to get the early bills out. I mean, we will have a session. We need to get the early bills out. All right, any, any further questions on this? Okay. Then we will get into the revenues, starting with liquor. Chris is uh, the chairman of the liquor commission. Yeah, the chairman, uh, Malika, is on the line, as well as uh, Tina Demers, the CFO, is also available. Um, I can pull up the worksheet like I did yesterday, or I can just leave the um, screen blank for the moment, and you can tell me what you need. Pull up the worksheet. Thank you. Okay, I'll do that right now. And while he's pulling up the worksheet, you have the handout that was presented to us from the Liquor Commission. So you should see the worksheet now. Yes. And um, column D is the liquor revenue and column K is the beer tax revenue. Right. So commissioner, it's all yours. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Joseph Mollick, I'm the chairman of the Liquor Commission. With me is our CFO, Tina Demers. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, what we've presented uh, a few days ago is the numbers that, that, we are, uh, that we're comfortable with. Our sales were strong 
in the month of January due to a sale that we run that includes all product uh, right at the moment. Our total revenues are up 4.7% or 4 million. And our liquor revenue to plan is up 5.3% or 4.1 million. But we are comfortable with the numbers that we've proposed and we don't expect to see any changes uh, moving forward toward the end of the year. Okay. Uh, any questions from the committee? Uh, Representative Brown. Yeah, so uh, when I look at, hi, hi uh, 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 Joe, how you doing? So listen, uh, the, the target was uh, 133.8 million, that was the plan. It looks like you're still holding it to, to the rest of the year coming in at 129, is that what you're saying? That's correct. Even though, well, not, even though you think it, the strength there, you, you won't be able to make up that ground? No, well, you'll notice that the transfer to the alcohol fund is 18.5 million. So right. that's uh, right. Right. that's that's up 230 uh, percent, or 11.5 million dollars. So, uh, you know, it's it, that's the balance of of where where the money ends up. So, okay. right. But you're you're expecting a, a pretty robust increase from that. Uh, was that, that, that wasn't a one-time transfer, right? This is happening every year? Every year we do 5%, which is the 10 million. And then this, this past budget cycle, they added the new uh, law that allows for HHS to ask for additional funds if the granted advantage account is going to fall short. And that's the additional 8.5 they're asking for this year. Okay, so in your 136, 136.6 and 136.3 it doesn't includes anticipate the, it does it, it in two, in, well, what does it anticipate it includes the 10 million dollars at five percent of our gross profit from prior year it does not include any additional funds that they may need because that would be based on their quarterly review each year okay all right all right that, that makes you now that reminded me what why there's such a difference between the 129 and the 136 is that there was an extra payment that had to be made. Okay, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, uh, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, just uh, th the question is uh, looking forward to 22 and 23. Um, what are the well, can you speak to us about the risks, the developments that might uh, um, get in the way of achieving those numbers that you've got uh, as your estimate? What are the what are, what are the downside risks? Well, we don't we don't foresee any downside risk. The market are, the market is strong. Our sales are strong. Our brand is is doing well. We're uh, we've closed some stores, as you all know and consolidated others and are building six new stores this year. So uh, we don't foresee any risk in our market and our sales market uh, in order to meet those numbers. Again, those numbers uh, pose uh, the 5% to uh, transfer to HHS. So if HHS's numbers uh, expound beyond that, that will affect those numbers that you see. And that's certainly a possibility. But as we've always said, Representative, uh, our, our job is to, is to make the money and bring the profit in and where the money goes is, is uh, the job of the, of the legislature. So we always, we just do our best to make the funds and then wherever the funds are allocated, that's, that's certainly fine with us, sir. Okay, well, thank you, you answered my question. Uh, Representative Elmy. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we, we at, the, at the moment, we are selling to a captive population that is stuck in their second homes in New Hampshire and on um, working remotely. And it's conjectured on um, drinking and smoking and doing a few other things like that uh, more than they used to. Um, do you, 
are you assuming that once they've, a number of them have moved back and we have tourism running properly again, that we will, um, we will just substitute the tourism for that and that we will be able to continue to grow, grow the market? Well, our, our numbers are, are continually representing that 50% of our 50, 51% of our business is cross-border sales. And that has not changed during the pandemic. Uh, we've seen a slight increase in, in in-state sales. And obviously uh, the real estate market in the, in the state of New Hampshire is very hot at the moment. Uh, you're hard pressed to find a house on the market for more than a few days. So we've certainly enjoyed that market and people moving into the state. And uh, a lot of those people are working remotely from wherever, whatever state they came from. And uh, we're probably visiting our state as tourists prior to that. So uh, it really hasn't affected the it hasn't affected the balance of our sales. So we really don't uh, we haven't seen what I would consider a tremendous spike, and we certainly don't intend to see anything fall off, given that our cross border sales have remained consistent. Hmm. Thank you very much. Could you? Um, I was trying to look at the previous presentation and. You didn't do a chart that explained the factors that, that produced your revenue estimates in that. At least I couldn't find it uh, just now. Do we, did we get given something like that? On, on slide five, we show the breakdown of our revenue categories and the growth. So this has our um, revenue from liquor and wine. Our, our revenue from beer and our other revenue. And then if you go to slide six, you can see that we've shown with that revenue and our expenses, what our total net profit equates to. So we should be able to tell it from slides five and six when we can find slides five and six. I can't do both pages Correct. at once. When you're sharing the screen, I can't, can't split my screen. That is correct, though. That the breakdown is on five and six, and it flows into slide um, eight and nine, where it shows you the breakdown of what's being transferred to the general fund to HHS and what's being transferred for the beer tax. Okay, thank you. I would recommend that you have a printed copy with you when you're at these meetings, because they do have that type of information. And the other thing on the cross border, border sales, I live right on the border in Plasto. And if you go by the liquor store or any stores in Plasto, the vast majority of licenses that you see are out of state, primarily Massachusetts. And so I, I agree with the commissioner that, that the cross border sales is still way up. Um, hold on one second. I'm going to bring my, my participant list back up. Uh, Representative Alman, you're all, all set? Yes, I'll take my hand down. Okay. On, but on, that's an awful lot of paper that, oh, that okay. we're having to print out. It's a big job, too. Representative Al uh, Bromney, followed by Representative T Tudor. Representative Alney, I mean, uh, Bromney. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Commissioner. Um, so when when the virus started, what we, what you I think when you testified, uh, you know, maybe about nine months ago, that the that the phenomenon was that uh, store sales uh, increased as restaurant sales decreased. So as the as the virus as the virus diminishes, are you are you anticipating that the reverse will be true? That uh, obviously restaurants as they open now they're never going to open to where they were in terms of the numbers, but but you're are you expecting the reverse to be true? That it'll kind of wash out that that more more liquor will be consumed in a restaurant and less at your stores. Well, 
representative what we've seen thus far is at, at the height of the pandemic uh, restaurant sales were off as much as 45 to 50 percent and and since that has declined some at this point as of january 31st 2021 uh, our on-premise partners were only down 25.3 percent so we're already starting to see uh, that the revenues from that area increase. Uh, so we're, we're very pleased with that. Obviously, they're a very important part of our business and important part of our economy. So uh, with that, though, our sales have continued to go up. But we also feel that, you know, given the sale that we run in any particular month, as I've just said, the past month is, was a very popular sale and the sales will, will, will trend up. And now when in February and March, when we do, uh, I don't wanna say less popular sales, but sales of uh, uh, less grandeur, you'll see those sales decline. As we come back into the spring, uh, you'll see the sales increase again. So the, the, the traffic remains consistent. Uh, the gross profit is strong because we haven't run any gift card sales for the year. But, and we don't intend to run any, at least for this upcoming uh, fiscal year. Okay. But it's nice to see that our restaurant partners are starting to gain some ground back and people are feeling comfortable and, and going out and that, that uh, attributes to their growth. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Representative. Representative Tudor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm just curious if we have any visibility into the 22-23 numbers that HHS um, might want more than their 5%. That would give us a little downside on these numbers if they come back in and ask for more. Those numbers are, are based off of the quarterly review that they do in the fund. So we wouldn't know until each of those years. And, and at this point, we don't know if they're going to need more when they do their next quarterly review for this year, right now they're projecting that they need the 18.5, but if, if for some reasons their funds look like they're going to be a little short by the end of the year, we could potentially have to transfer more. And, and obviously representative, that's not something that we're in control of. And, and as I've said, we just earn the funds here and, and, the, and the legislature spends them the way they feel they need to. And we're very comfortable with that system. Okay. Representative Tudor, are you all set? I'm all set. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, uh, I want to thank the commissioner and, the, uh, and Tina. Thank uh, you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The committee. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. And we can move on to the insurance department. And Norma Stalin is here, and I think there was there was a new handout, right, uh, Chris? There is. I sent it out last night, Rems of Major, but I can put it up on my screen if that's helpful for Norma. Why don't you do that? And then they, the insurance department can walk us through it. Um, the commissioner, I believe, is also in attendance as well as um, the Deputy Commissioner Rice and um, Amy Duhame. So they're all available to answer any questions as, as we go through the presentation. Right. So I'll share my screen and then the um, insurance department can tell me which slide they want me to move to at what point. I'll just start off uh, and say, this is Chris Nicolopoulos, Commissioner over here at Insurance. Uh, I'm joined with Amy Duhame, who's our uh, Premium Tax um, Administrator, and Norma Stallings, who's our uh, Compliance Tax uh, Lead. Uh, Norma's going to answer any questions and walk you through, but I wanted to attend in case anyone had any questions for me. Thanks. Norma, you're on. Norma, you're still muted. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. We're here today to uh, 
update you on what we're projecting for fiscal year 2022 and 2023. I just thought I'd initially give you a little bit more background and in information as far as what is actually taxable. The gross direct premiums, which include renewal premiums, less dividends, less return premiums, is the primary uh, source of the taxable base. Direct premiums written on stop loss reinsurance provided to self-insurance groups, it's also taxable. There are also policy fees in membership and other fees that may not be part of the premium, but are part of what the cost of the insurance policy is, and they're also taxable. Policy dividends applied to buy purchase life insurance, which is additional paid up insurance is taxable. And technically that is offset because it's a policy dividend. So it's an in and an out of the calculation. There are uh, other uh, considerations in insurance that will uh, also be taxable. Uh, the insurance companies will provide us with that information. Medicaid premium is subject to premium tax. Medicare supplemental policies are known as Medigap policies, which are sold by an insurance company are subject to premium tax. This is not to be confused with a, medic, a, a Medicare Advantage plan. Okay, so the, what's tax exempt? Political <laughs> subdivisions. So- go Any further, Norma, you said not to be confused with the uh, Medicare Advantage Plans. Oh, Correct. Right. Yes, there there are Medicare's Medigap policies that are sold that are not have not been approved through the uh, federal uh, center of Medicare and Medicaid services. So they are not Medicare Advantage plans. So uh, the Medicare Advantage plans tax or not tax? Medicare Advantage plans are not taxed. Okay. Which, okay, we, which is brought up on the next slide here. So Medicare Advantage plans, which are sold through uh, insurance companies are not taxable. The other thing is the political subdivisions. So, if a county, city, town, or village purchases a coverage of uh, health or dental through the insurance companies, there is no tax associated with those po policies. Also, Medicare Part D, which is the pharmaceutical coverage that uh, is through uh, the Center of Medicare and Medicaid Services, that's not subject to premium tax. Federal employee health benefit programs are not subject to premium tax. Servicemen's group life insurance and federal crop insurance are not subject to premium tax. So that's the the come are the part of the components in deriving what the tax base is. On this slide here is the fiscal year 2021, our current fiscal year that uh, we're in. And right now we had originally projected 130.9 million dollars, and we had subsequently change that to 128.2 million based on uh, what was happening in the markets, the uh, automobile insurance refunds and the unemployment. So if people were 
not going to be covered by health policies. And some of that was also a shift to possibly these people being eligible for Medicaid. So currently, and I think I jumped ahead here, it should say, as reported in December's revenue focus, we're currently $2 million over plan. And that's attributed to the uh, fees that are collected for producer and adjusters licensing fees. Uh, I really don't have an explanation why there were a considerable increase in the licensing, but there were a number of adjusters and producers that newly licensed in the last uh, few few months that were had not been licensed before. So, and that's approximately one and a half million that's. Uh, causing that increase. So now moving on to fiscal year 2022 and 2023. Again, this is the uh, summary of the calculation. The tax premium tax liability that is reduced by the prepayment and then we receive the estimated payment for the following year. There's also the unlicensed or non-admitted market premium tax, which we're coming down to what we estimate to be the premium tax revenue. And again, uh, we're anticipating that it's going to be a, a slow recovery. The businesses, and even may not come back to buy the insurance and there may be further decreases in auto. So the, the, that's part of the components that uh, led us to believe that 2022 would be less and then we would have an increase in premium tax for 2023, hoping that uh, the economy rebounds. As a an, result, the current fiscal estimate for fiscal year 2022 is 127 million and 2023 is 133.3 million. The next slide is the detail of the computation. This slide is the actuaries information that is provided to us for the uh, premium growth patterns. And they're coming up with us by looking at what they're getting for tax rates, I mean, not, not tax rates, for the policy rates that they're approving and also what they're seeing in the market. So what ends up happening is the premium tax growth rates for the projections Let's take, for instance, for fiscal year 2021, the property and casualty is anticipated to grow 2.65%. On the next slide, we have the amount that 2.65 is multiplied times the actual uh, property and casualty premium of 2,463.44 to come up with the 2,528.72 in the next column. So that's how it rolls forward. Again, the next column is the growth rate of 2.55 times the calculated rate of 2,528.72. The following year, again, we go back to the growth rate of 2.55, multiply it times our 2, 2,593.2 to derive at what the estimated 
premium written for property casualty will be. And that's how this whole schedule works out. I, you multiply the growth rates times the prior, starting off with what was the actual calendar year to come up with the extrapolated next calendar year. So for premium written in total, we're anticipating for fiscal year 2021 that it would be six billion four hundred and sixty two point seventeen. And again, the, the columns just foot down fiscal year 2022, six billion four hundred and eighty six million point seventy two. In the following year, slight increase of six billion six hundred and twenty eight point twenty seven. On the next slide, we have the first line takes the property and casualty lines that are taxed at one and a quarter percent. So we're simply taking one and a quarter percent and multiplying it. Uh, we've got the premium tax is adding together the four, first four lines on slide eight to come up with what the premium tax, net premium tax is at one and a quarter. And then we add the, as I mentioned, what was taxable was the finance charges in any of the other charges that uh, are assessed to come up with the new tax base of 3,158.8. And that's basically the information going across the page for the business lines that are taxed at 2%, which are your accident and health. We again, going back to slide eight and adding the medical and health lines of business at 2% in coming up with the taxable. And then we deduct the tax exempt part, Medicaid, Medicare Advantage, Medicare Part D, the federal uh, employee health benefits to come up with what is the taxable base at 2%. So after we've got the, on the next slide is actually the calculations where the tax liability, again, we're taking the prior information, the net taxable for property in life, multiplying that times one and a quarter, and taking the Medicare, the medical and health at 2% to come up with the 103.08. 100, and that's how the, the works all the way across is that just multiplying the net taxable premium times the applicable New Hampshire rate of either one and a quarter or 2%. We also have the retaliatory tax rate. That is actually based on what additional tax is collected because I mentioned in our other presentation, uh, there is a retaliatory provision which allows us to collect the greater of the tax rate that the company's state of domicile charges as opposed to what New Hampshire charges. And that amount is actually, I look at the last three years average in the last five years average in estimate it based on what I see the trend going. 
So that's merely a, a estimate based on what the prior year's actual have been. The retaliatory items are, again, when a company is domiciled in Delaware, for instance, Delaware has a fraud fee. So because Delaware assesses that fraud fee on a New Hampshire company doing business in Delaware, New Hampshire collects on the Delaware companies that are doing business in New Hampshire, that fraud fee. In the uh, purpose of that is again, to equalize the tax burden. So one state will have an assessment that New Hampshire doesn't have in New Hampshire will retaliate because again, the New Hampshire companies are paying that assessment in the company in the state that is assessing has the assessment. Norma, I have a question. Okay. Um, the retaliatory tax rate that is in percentage. The nine point four. The tax rate is is an. What I'm doing there is I'm taking an average of the three, the most recent three years in the most recent five years, actual in calculated in seeing which way the amounts are trending. So that the average of 9.4%. That would be the prior actual information that I had. Well, the first column is for fiscal year 2020, that is actual. That was 9.4, 9 uh, But when I calculated out for fiscal year 2021, I looked at the 9.4 plus the actual amounts for the other four years prior and there had been, uh, you know, swings up and down. Mm -hmm. So when I looked at it, it looked potentially to uh, decrease. And again, what impacts the retaliatory tax rate is when a, a given company will redomicile uh, to another state. For instance, if a Massachusetts company redomiciles to Wisconsin, the Massachusetts rate of 2.28% no longer applies. They are governed by the tax rates in Wisconsin. Uh, in what I really want to get at, it's not where you have the retaliatory tax rate. It's not the rate. It's the amount of money generated right. in millions of dollars. Yes, yes. Yeah, because... Uh, when I saw that, I said, "Okay." <laughs> you said, "Oh, wow! Yes, yes. Okay, that I should have clear clarified that that it's not the right. it's the now that uh, we, dollars collected. It's a retaliatory amount yeah. collected." Okay, yeah, we I'm got not, that. Yeah. So now I come down to on um, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Representative Bromley has his hand up, and I may have a different question. Uh, Representative Bromley. Representative Bromley, yeah, you're I'm, muted. I'm, yeah, I am muted. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, great presentation. Uh, this is the most detail you've <laughs> we've ever seen over the years. This is great. Uh, something that we obviously couldn't replicate. Uh, so you've done your homework here. But it's all, it's all really driven on the premium tax growth rate. Uh, most of this, uh, and that, and I, I just want to double check. It's both the increase in the rates as well as the number of policies. Correct when they give you that growth rate, it's both. Come yes, on. yes. And so we're relying on these consultant firm. Now, who who are these folks again? The actuaries in the department. We have the chief uh, oh, no, 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 uh, property no. and casualty, and we have one uh, life accident health. 
No, no. I mean, I mean, you said you we used some kind of a firm that helped us calculate uh, the growth rates. No, no. Oh, they're sorry, they're they are department employees. Okay. Okay. All right. Hey, Representative Bromley, um, I have to step out for a minute, so if you take over. Okay. All right, I'm, I'm set. Um, I can, let me see. Who, uh, Representative Almy, I think you have your hand up too. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure you are going to explain to us what retaliatory item basis is, aren't you? I don't remember ever seeing that one. Sure. Th that's when the state... As I said, for instance, Delaware has a fraud fee. California has a fraud fee. Pennsylvania has a fraud fee. And since the New Hampshire companies that do business in the other states are charged those fraud fees, we are able to charge the Delaware, Pennsylvania, California companies, the same fees based on what the business they do in New Hampshire. We collect primarily from the Massachusetts companies and the Illinois companies that do business in New Hampshire. Okay, you all said uh, Representative Army? Yes, that's a new one. Thank you very much. Okay, so yep. any other questions? No, no, I think we're set for the moment. Can keep on, you can keep on going. Okay, please. Thank all you. right. Okay, so that brings us down to the tax liability before credits. The business enterprise tax credit that the insurance companies pay that is allowed as a credit against the premium tax. Uh, and if there is a life and health guarantee fund class B assessment that applies, the companies that are assessed are allowed to take that over a five year period as a credit. The Community Development Finance Authority a company that uh, donates or contributes to a given project, they are allowed 75% of that contribution as a credit against the premium tax. That brings us down to the tax liability. And from the tax liability, we have received the estimated prepayment that in the prior tax year to apply. So similar to any, any business that during the tax year, they pay an estimated payment. Uh, we actually collected all at tax season on March 15th. It's not a quarterly payment as most companies would pay. So the net difference between what the tax liability is and what their credit is, uh, we use the term, it's the true up of that tax year. Now then based on what the tax liability is, the there's a 100% estimated payment for the following year that comes up there in, I'm um, incorrect because that does that says preceding and it should say following year. I'm sorry. And that's supposed to be based on what the tax liability is. There's sometimes a change, little bit of a change uh, on occasion because companies will submit an additional payment anticipating that their tax liability the following year is going to be greater. So with the true up in the estimated payment, we come down to what our licensed companies tax cash that we anticipate to collect. The unlicensed or non-admitted market, again, that is an estimated number based on 
what the averages have been in the past three to five years. We come down to what the premium tax revenue is. Then we have various fees. The majority of the fees that are collected are from the licensing of insurance producers and adjusters. There are also the fees for the licensing of the companies. There are filing fees. There's also the penalties and fines that are assessed that are included in the, the fee number. The following number is that transfer for the Granite Advantage Trust, which is 2% of the what is the Medicare Advantage premium. And that brings us down to what our cash basis is for the revenue. There is a slight adjustment at the end of every fiscal year because we're collecting that estimated payment of in the prior year for the following year, we have to, uh, we can only recognize as of June 30th, half of that revenue. So there is a deferred revenue account that accumulates that deferred amount for accounting purposes. So I just like to, you know, let you know because that number the accrued basis is what finally is the number that shows up on the comprehensive financial annual report. So I think now it's just if there are any questions or anything that you feel you want yes. to have clarification on. Yes, Representative Alma has a question. If we could go back to that page again. How do you uh, estimate what the transfer is going to have to be to Granite Advantage? Is it under current law? We, we have an estimated uh, go back to page slide eight. Uh, again, this, this number here, the, after at the next to the last line here, Granite Advantage Health Plans. So that's what we're anticipating, what the premium on that uh, uh, Medicaid ex expansion would be. And, and it's that premium tax that is transferred over to the Department of Health and Human Services to that dedicated fund. And is that that estimate is based on what's written in the law right now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Because they keep changing it every by any. <laughs> yes, they do. So, I'm are there Norm, any other Norm questions? Is, I see Norm is back, so I'm going to turn it back to Norm. Okay. You know, I have no idea what the insurance. I mean, we'd never do without Norma. Uh, oh, I thank you. You are so thorough, and we've always uh, taken your numbers uh, with a lot of confidence. Well, I, I try. I unfortunately am a very detailed person, so I like to share the information that I have. I know you are, and we're, I'm. The, uh, Norm, Norm, there's one more hand up. Uh, I just, uh, well, there was. Uh, working on uh, uh, Hack and Phillips. Yes, yes. Thank you. I just, uh, I think I figured it out. But when I look at page 10 or slide 10 of your presentation today, uh, for fiscal year 21, I'm seeing that 127 million 960 number. And then when I look at the revenue worksheet for column F for fiscal year 21, I'm seeing the range is different and I'm just trying to figure out um, you know why it's reported one way in one slide and, and then a different presentation it's reported in a different way. Well 
The information that I reported on slide five was as presented to the House Ways and Means for an update, mm -hmm. whereas the information on slide 10 is a little bit more with a little bit more updated information once we had uh, some adjustments to the actual for uh, calendar year 2019, which impacts fiscal year 2020. And again, that would go back to your previous statement about those insurance company payouts and the reasons why there were reduced premium taxes at the, at the outset of your presentation today. The payouts, what, which are you, you're talking about the pre estimated prepayments? Uh, Norma, I think she's referring to the, uh, the, auto, re uh, the auto rebates that we oh. experienced over the summer. Yeah. You, you yeah. Said I think at the outside of your presentation, you, you had seen some decline. Right. We made some uh, adjustments in, but that impacted fiscal year 2021. And that was part part of the uh, reason for uh, decreasing the original from the original. Okay, great, thank you. So, very, very good point, Representative. Uh, Norm, does that mean that Chris, is Chris going to update our sheet to that new number, 128? Instead of it will be. So just so I can confirm what Norma, are you suggesting that for 21, it's going to be 127.6 million instead of the 128.2 million? Uh, that's the latest number. Uh, Is that again? So, so Norma, just, just so the committee understands that your, your most recent number that they should base their estimate on is on slide 10. Yes. And in fiscal year 21, it would be 127.6 million. Fiscal year 22 would be 127 million. And fiscal 23 would be 133.3 million. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, that, that, that's, that's true based on what information that I had at the time. Yep. I, I just... will tell you that uh, we are uh, ahead of uh, schedule as far as what the is being reported in the revenue focus reports. So, so just to clarify one more time, are, are you more comfortable, is the department more comfortable suggesting you're going to be closer to the 128.2 million that you show on slide five? Or do you think it's going to be closer to the 127 million that's on slide 10? Oh, good point. For, for the fiscal year 21. 21. Uh, I would go with the uh, 128.2 million. Okay. Okay. So I, I think we're good then on the worksheet. Yeah. Thank you, Norma. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? If not, thank you, the insurance department, for a great presentation. Thank you. Have a good day. Norm, thank you, guys. Norm, Norm, we'll go on to Norm, security Norm. revenues. Is Chris, is Barry Glennon here? Norm, uh, Representative Brown is trying to ask something. Uh, uh, Fred has an update on Mary. She's fine. Oh, good. Yep. I've been worried about her. Fred, do you want to give it? I see you're, you're on now. Yeah, she she was uh, staying with a friend, um, but she, I, I saw her, spoke to her. She's fine. Okay. Good. Thanks, Fred. Yep. Okay, we'll go on to securities. And Barry Glennon, Director of Security Bureau is here, I hope. Chris yes. is here. He is, he's ready to speak when, when you're ready, Representative Major. All set. Mr. Chair, uh, can the committee hear me okay? And can you bring up the uh, worksheet, Chris? Actually, Mr. Chair, I have uh, an updated worksheet. Okay, all right then. Um, 
bring that one up. Oh, I see. Okay. If, if you would allow me to uh, share the screen. Go right ahead. All right. And are you able to view that, uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. Oh, terrific. Um, thank you, uh, members of the committee, uh, for allowing me uh, to present uh, this morning. Um, a, uh, just a quick, quick update with respect to revenues since we last uh, um, met or, or when I last presented. Um, as of uh, December 31 of, of last year, I reported that we had revenues totaling uh, uh, 2.282 million, uh, but we did anticipate uh, a considerable uh, increase in revenue for the month of January. And we did in fact, uh, as it anticipated, uh, receive uh, uh, fees for uh, broker and investment advisors. Uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, that amount that came in was $14,217,100. So as you can see for uh, 2021 in blue year to date through January 31, uh, broker dealer fees are now at $15,947,084. Uh, uh, we do project that uh, we will uh, complete the fiscal year uh, at $16,750,000 uh, for that particular category. Um, so that, that represents the um, probably the number that most committee members may have had a concern about because through, June, through December 31, it, it just seemed off. Uh, but we knew that revenue would be coming in. So we are still uh, on track about projecting uh, 41,250,000 for uh, fiscal year uh, 2021. Uh, I would also like to point out in terms of securities registrations, if I may lower the screen here for you. Um, right now, it's just showing that $601,000. Um, however, we receive vast majority uh, of our mutual fund uh, fees, uh, which are due on May 1. And that will be, that will create a, a significant influx of revenue. The number is still questionable. Uh, as far as how many mutual fund companies will renew, but we are, are comfortable in projecting uh, 24.5 million in fees for uh, securities registrations, which would uh, total and bring us up to the 41,250. Um, so those are the updated uh, numbers, Mr. Chair. I'd be happy to answer any questions that the committee may have. Uh, yes, yeah, so one second. I gotta bring the participant list up. Uh, Representative Elmy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On, are you, is your system able to receive all of these electronically, or are you dependent on the USPS, which has been having terrible problems? Yes. The, the vast majority of our revenues now are received electronically. Uh, we have been working with mutual fund companies uh, to make filings electronically. It used to be just hard copy checks. Uh, however, we do have a means by which they can transmit uh, the renewal for us or to us along with the revenue. So it uh, provides for a uh, timely receipt of those monies. Thank you very much. Okay. Further questions? So what you're saying is that for fiscal 21, you're estimating $41,250,000. That's correct. And uh, it, it potentially could be higher depending upon mutual fund renewals, which uh, we will see uh, come May 1. And uh, we'll certainly be monitoring that. Okay, so, so that's <clears throat> essentially what you gave us. Yes. Yep. Further questions? And Christopher, I will provide you with a copy of, of this uh, after the meeting. Thank you, Barry. Okay. okay, I don't see any questions and we thank you for coming in and updating this information. Representative Balmy has her hand up. Oh. Representative yeah. has her. Could I just have a follow-up on my previous question? On, um, I believe that we, usually get the um, first category of fees, the dealer fee, broker dealer fees in, in December, but a couple of times they've come in January. 
If you're electronic now, why are they still coming late? Well, the, we're, unfortunately, we are at the mercy of FINRA, which is the former NASD. Uh, they are the entity that will collect the revenue from the various broker dealers and investment advisors and remit it to us. And it, oftentimes it's a timing issue. Um, I, I understand that the actual funds were received in the treasury uh, on December 31, but did not necessarily hit until the first business day in January. So it really was just, a, it was really a matter of timing. We, we experienced that and I received several calls too towards the end of the year, uh, calendar year, uh, inquiring as to whether those funds will hit or not. Uh, so uh, in this case here, yes, the FINRA did remit them to the state on 12-31, but it didn't hit our books until the first business day in January. Uh, any further questions from the committee? I don't see any. Uh, thank you for coming in and providing this updated information. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So now we can go to lottery. Uh, Chris is Charlie here. He's not. He's not in the call yet, um, Representative Major. So he, he may be coming in closer to 1030. Okay. That's 10 minutes away. Um, I spoke to him this morning, Char uh, Norm. Yeah. Uh, so he knows, he knows he's going to call around 1030. All right. <clears throat> Why don't we take a five minute break?
This is Charlie here. He's not yet Remsev Major. I expect him momentarily. Okay. Um, but I did get a response from John Williams regarding Dr. Chan and coming to the committee. And it's unsure at this time if he's going to have the availability. Um, but John Williams did indicate that last Friday there was a meeting with the um, health, House Health and Human Services and Elderly Affairs Committee. I guess it was a two hour um, meeting where they recorded Dr. Chan's presentation to them. And I will get a link and share that with the committee because that may address some of the questions. Okay. Um, the other thing that John Williams suggested, um, if we can't get a time with Dr. Chan, is if there's specific questions from committee members, we could compile them and send them over to um, John Williams and he would get responses from Dr. Chan and his group for the committee. But we are, he is checking the availability of Dr. Chan, but I guess there's been significant requests on his time to present to various groups, including the legislature. Um, so he's, he's having some challenges there. Or, or if there is somebody else who would have some idea <clears throat> of what's going on relative to the COVID and what's the worst case and the best case scenario and the timing of these. Yep. Yeah, no, that was part of the um, request. So uh, I told them, um, John, I would follow up after you guys are done meeting this morning and just let him know what the response was from the committee. Yeah, see, see if he has somebody else that he could. Yep, will do. Okay. Because uh, I'd like to have an interface with the committee members and the presenter. I indicated that uh, to uh, Mr. Williams that it, there may be questions that kind of arise through the discussion that you're not thinking of at this moment and that if having somebody talk to the committee may be the preferred method. Right. Yeah, and it, just to add to that, uh, I think that's get, get the best we can from Dr. Chan. That's very important. But uh, Representative Murphy identified a few, couple of other people. And I think uh, you said, Representative Major, that you were interested in pursuing that. And I think having perspectives, uh, sort of a broader range of perspectives would be good on this uh, difficult issue. Right, you will at least have the link to uh, Chan's presentation, and, but we still want to have somebody to present this to us. Uh, Chris, if I may, um, there's two names that you might ask uh, uh, them about, uh, Jose Mercado, M-E-R-C-A-D-O, and uh, Michael Calderwood, both DH epidemiologists, and they've been giving talks as well. So you might just ask him about those two people. Okay, thank you. Sure. So we're working on it. Could, could I just make a suggestion too? Yes, Susan. In order to make it more attractive, I should think the finance committee needs to listen to this too. Well, once we- Maybe once we could we join. Time. I'm, I'm going to have, I'm going to invite the Finance Committee, and there's some of these things I'm going to invite the uh, Senate Ways and Means Committee to also. Where it's virtual, it's, uh, it might as well. It doesn't make, we don't have to worry about rooms. There are a lot of advantages, aren't there? Yes. <laughs> It's really quite surprising. Whoever would have thought that sitting in our own house would be as interesting. It's working out better than I thought it would. Yeah, me too. And, uh, and, and no trouble hearing you at all. And, and Representative Malloy uh, really hit the nail on the head when he said, by being home, you have access to all kinds of things. Your records, your files, another laptop, etc. So, major um, in, uh, a minority opinion, I think it's an enormous disadvantage to freshmen. I think that's probably I, I, I agree. That's why the freshmen, no matter, do not feel silly, do not feel stupid or anything else. 
jump in and ask questions. There's, there's hardly an item there that you can't question. And that's the way you really dig into this stuff by getting started with the questions. So I encourage you to do that. We have a major, uh, Mr. McIntyre is on the call now, so you can start with your um, reven revenues related to lottery if you would like. Right, and does he have a um, screen he wants to share? Or do we use- Morning, Representative, Mr. Chairman. Charlie McIntyre here for the lottery. I have a bad connection, so I'm ho I, may, I may just go to um, audio if that's okay. So good, good morning. This is Charlie McIntyre for the lottery. Uh, I had presented to you uh, a couple weeks ago um, revenue estimates this year of $120 million. And the next two years would be fiscal year 22 of $125 million and fiscal year 23 of $127 million. Uh, we anticipate uh, growth next year, particularly in sports betting and internet. Uh, we do not expect instant tickets to continue their tremendous growth, which we have enjoyed over the last year. Uh, and the out year, sort of the second year of the biennium, I would anticipate Massachusetts to have sports betting. So I'd anticipate a slowdown of revenues there. Um, obviously, we're still subject to the normal economic pressures of gas prices uh, and the like and the general economy. But certainly, uh, that's it in a nutshell. I, I, I think our revenues are pretty basic. And I'm happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Questions from the committee members. Uh, Representative Baxter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I couldn't hear what you said there. You said you expected something to slow down. Um, what, what, like a ticket or something? No, I'm sorry. So certainly uh, one thing would be sports betting. I anticipate Massachusetts will enact sports betting in the next year and we'll have it live by the second year of our biennium. Secondarily, I would anticipate scratch ticket sales, which have enjoyed tremendous growth this gotcha. year to slow down probably certainly next year into the following year. Uh, not stop growth, but certainly slow down. We're up 20% on scratch ticket sales, which is historic. So uh, I, I never like to plan for historic events. Got it, thank you. Representative Bromley. Hi, Charlie. Uh, to uh, just amplify that a little bit for the committee, uh, what percentage of sports betting is coming from out of state or like from Massachusetts, but out of state in general? So, so currently approximately 20% of our mobile activity is coming from out of state. So 80% give or take is coming from New Hampshire, Vermont and Maine. In Maine and Vermont, they're very small, 1% or 2%, 3% um, of the mobile side. Of our retail side, the majority is coming from Massachusetts. Um, and so the facilities at Seabrook and, and Manchester, to a lesser extent, will be financially impacted. We have things we plan on doing if indeed that happens. And it depends on where those facilities are located. It certainly looks like the facilities would be located in Everett which is a far distance from our border, thankfully. But if one were to be located in Lowell, say, that would be very different. Follow up? Follow up. So do you anticipate they're gonna have, uh, just like us, they're gonna have mobile as well as, as brick and mortar uh, places? Correct. Okay. I would just make a lot of mobile. From what I've read from the press reports, uh, press reports, it looks like the, uh, they won't have college sports, which is certainly a big um, activity for us. And as we go into March, it's actually the largest sports event in the spring, uh, the college basketball tournament. Uh, and college football is obviously big in the fall. So we'll have a competitive advantage there. But yes, it's my anticipation they'll have mobile as well as physical retail locations. Just to follow up again, uh, Norm, uh, if you don't mind. Follow up. Uh, Charlie, you, you want to explain that to the committee? Just we have a few minutes here uh, about the sports uh, spending on, on colleges. My recollection is that there was some blackouts, though, right? For yeah, for for New Hampshire teams. Yes, and so there's a current blackout. 
Uh, you're not allowed to bet on a state of New Hampshire team, whether that be UNH or Dartmouth, for say, for example. The only exception would be is if they're in another tournament. So, for example, if UNH makes the college basketball tournament, you're allowed to bet on the tournament as a whole, but you're not allowed to bet on UNH individually. Uh, and so that was in a request from the colleges that they asked for that we were happy to abide by, and you folks obviously abided by it as well. Okay, thank you, Charlie. Hey, Representative Almy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On about the scratch tickets, you say they're they're not going to be growing. Are they going to be falling again once people can get out and about more? I don't think so. Certainly, um, it's been growth for the last 10 years, almost unabated. So, uh, and that's in a gross dollar terms and also in net dollar terms. But I would anticipate at some point, it just will be slowing. Not, so one of the things is the so last year, our profit was approximately 100 million. And this year it's approximately, our, we're estimating $120 million. So $20 million increase in profit is, well, it's historic. So. I would anticipate it slowing, and certainly this is us being conservative. Thank you. Uh, further questions? Uh, Representative Ames. Uh, Representative Ames, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I got it. You got it? Um, yeah, Charlie. Uh, I may have missed this, but um, <clears throat> could you uh, speak to how other developments in Massachusetts, particularly their big casinos, um, are impacting or might impact uh, um, our revenues here? Um, and so I'm not talking about sports betting, the future of sports betting in Massachusetts or their lottery program, but the casino. Oh, and you may have spoken to this, and I, I may have missed it. If so, I'm sorry. No, no, certainly. Uh, thank you for the question, Representative Ames. Um, the impact that a casino, the casino in Boston would have would be really related to charitable gambling side, which for the purposes of revenues to the state is quite minor. We only estimate 3 to $4 million profit for the state from charitable gaming. It will impact the charity, certainly. Obviously, with their casinos closed because of COVID, it hasn't had quite the impact. And candidly, because of the location of the facility in Everett, it, it being Everett, and its sort of inaccessibility, as well as their economic price point, it also hasn't had the same impact that we expected. Meaning it's hard to get to and really expensive while you're there, uh, in contrast to the facilities in New Hampshire. Uh, follow up. Follow up. Um, so what about the... Uh casino in Springfield, uh, which is maybe too far away to be a big impact, and uh, the, uh, what do they call it, uh, Slats uh, Casino in um, central Massachusetts? Yeah, you certainly, that's a good, good question. We have seen more activity. We've seen more folks from New Hampshire drive to Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun than we have seen go to Everett, the, uh, the wind facility, and the one in Springfield, and certainly the one in Plain Ridge. Because, you know, if you're driving to Plain Ridge, it's a couple hours, you're going to continue on and go to Foxwoods, which is a much nicer facility. Uh, and certainly the, those two facilities in Connecticut have loyal customers, and they obviously reward customers. And so I think there's a, still that loyalty to those two facilities over and above the facilities in Massachusetts, more so than I anticipated when they were first um, proposed and they've been developed. Interesting. Worth watching. Yeah. Yeah, no, no question. And certainly there's another, there's a lawsuit pending about another possible facility in Massachusetts. Uh, there's one more casino to be located and that certainly is still in, in flux and where that goes. Uh, that would be in the not, Southeast, I think. Is exactly. That right? Unless yeah. they change their mind, unless they change their mind, look for a better location. I mean, my terror exists if they put it somewhere like in Lowell, that would be my absolute worst, our worst nightmare. Um, but they have not realized the revenues they expected, obviously. Don't say that too loud, Charlie. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> uh, further questions? Representative Bromley. 
questions. Uh, I'm going to ask you, Mr. Chair, is it uh, appropriate for Charlie to comment on House Bill 533 at this point? Since we are, uh, my sense is we're probably not because we're not we're not in a hearing session. I, I had a conversation this morning about one of the questions that was asked, and since we have him on the uh, Zoom, about uh, was the question was. Uh, is the Attorney General's office aware of uh, the new model that he's proposing in House Bill 533? And I mean, I can share his answer with the committee tomorrow, uh, or if you want to, he, since he's on the phone and we have a few minutes, uh, we could get it right directly from him. I don't know if it's violating anything for him to do that. I, I would allow it. This is a public hearing, and uh, we, ha <clears throat> we had a public hearing on that. We're going to be having another work session coming up. Public hearing. This question was Norm. That's one of the bills we're going to exact tomorrow. Right. Yes. So, are you saying it's okay or not okay? Okay. Charlie, yeah, Charlie certainly. Wants to respond. Oh, okay. Certainly. Uh, I think the question was: Had the no Attorney General's office been notified of this proposed legislation? And yes. the answer is yes. Our Chief Compliance Officer uh, is formerly of the Attorney General's office and talks to them regularly about all of our activities, including this, and they were aware of it and they are not opposed to it. Good. Representative Major. Representative Almy, uh, Bernstein first, and then followed by Representative Almy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Charlie. Good uh, morning. In your presentation from uh, a week or two ago, you, you did have a bullet point about the state of Massachusetts enacting sports betting. Is, is there any new information or is, is the pace of uh, your time frame of when it will be enacted? I guess my, my simple question is, do you still stand by the revenue estimates for 2022 and 23 or is there new information which is going to uh, adjust those estimates? No, I, the revenue estimates are the ones that I had uh, suggested in that presentation and we'll still stand by them. It's just, I don't anticipate the same growth that we would have realized had they not been. And I, like I said, it's a guess, right? Uh, what a legislature, particularly in Massachusetts will do. So um, it's my guess, but I would anticipate them legalizing it in this next legislative session, their, their current one, and it being impact revenues, not the next fiscal year, but the one thereafter I don't anticipate a down year. I just don't expect the same growth we would realize. Right, you, you do have some modest growth. We're going from 125 million to 127 and a half. And yeah, and certainly that's related also to the, I just, I really am conservative estimating revenues out two years because of what can happen in two years, oh, you know, representative, you know? Sure, perfectly understandable. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you. Uh, Representative Alamey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Charlie, I, I've got two questions, actually. The, one of them is relating to Representative Abrami's about 533. Does the AG's office do any enforcement for you now? Um, they don't. They don't. They do reviews for us, and they'll do background checks for us, um, but they don't do any criminal enforcement, no. Thank you. And then the other question is totally unrelated to that. Um, in the Massachusetts casinos, I think that there was some set up that they were going to be doing impact studies of um, the effect of the casinos on the communities, et cetera. Um, have they finished any about Plain Ridge, for instance, the slots casino? Yes, uh, Representative Almy, uh, that's a good question. I don't know, but I can certainly find out. Um, I'm quite friendly with the chair of the Mass Gaming Commission. Um, we used to have the same job in Massachusetts. She was the successor general counsel of the Mass Lottery to me, so I have no problem calling her and asking her. Terrific, thank you. Any further questions for Charlie? Uh, once more, any, any further questions for Charlie on the lottery revenues? Uh, okay, okay, Charlie, thanks for coming in again. Of course. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, thank you so much. Okay.
Chris. Yes, Chris, you know, Representative Major. Is anybody, is Kathy Labonte here? She is. And oh, we just bring her into the meeting. And um, if it helps, I can pull up their presentation from last week. It was just two pages. You can see the various revenue sources that, that go into help. the numbers. That would help. Okay, one moment. So it, it was just a two page um, presentation and I'll just have it on page two, which is the 21, 22 and 23 um, revenue estimates. And Kathy, you, you can just remind the committee of, of the various revenue sources um, and then they may have questions as a result of that. Okay, I was trying to, there we go, now you can see me, okay. Um, remind you of the different revenue types, go down through the list. Is, is that what you would like me to do this morning? I believe so, Kathy. Um, on, on the schedule you provided the committee last week, you, you know, you listed out like the licenses, the agent fees, just to remind the committee of what some of those might be. Okay. Our no problem. Now that they've had a week to think about it. Okay. Um, so we have our licenses, which is our biggest pot of unrestricted revenues, our Concord agent fees, which is the $1 fee per license type that is sold here in our Concord office. Miscellaneous sales and income is kind of a melting pot of revenues that does not have, fall into any other category. And as I stated last week, and I'll restate, the biggest deposit into that uh, fund is the internal administrative charge that we charge for overhead on all of our dedicated accounts here at the department. And that is approximately two hundred and fifty to $300,000 per year. The OHRV license agent fees is the same as the Concord agent fees, only that's the, um, OH, the fee charge for OHRV registrations. And for this current fiscal year, that just went up to $4 per registration. License agent fines and penalties, those funds are submitted by license agents that are late in submitting their monthly um, monthly reports along with their monthly remittances. They have until the 14th of the month to submit those. They are allowed to uh, request one waiver per year and we are allowed to find them. If, uh, of course, with COVID, we did allow a lot of people, uh, we were very, very lenient for a lot of people. Interest on savings deposits. I made a significant adjustment to our current fiscal year 21 budgeted on that because our interest revenues have taken a considerable nose dive, like all of ours. Sale on surplus property are those funds that we receive for equipment that we send over to um, surplus that subsequently gets sold to the public. Sale of surplus vehicles, same thing, only that is specific to all fishing game vehicles that get sold after we surplus them. Federal recoveries and direct costs, that is the uh, another large pot of funding and that is actually the indirect cost that is charged on all of our federal grants, which all of our federal grants is approximately seven to $10 million per year. And it's an overhead charge that we are able to charge for the cost of personnel and benefits um, that is overhead. Game management transfers. Let me read that one to you because that one's a little bit more detailed. Um, so initially all license revenues are deposited into that first pot of money, 5221. Um, but after monthly reconciliations, $10 from the sale of each turkey, bear, and waterfowl license sold in each moose application 
in subsequent permit when drawn are deposited into the dedicated game management account and all funds remaining are transferred into this unrestricted game management account. And the OHRV Marine unrefunded road toll per the RSAs that I notate below, 260 colon 60 and 260 colon 61 in statute. Those are transferred from the Department of Safety into the unrestricted fishing game fund. Is that helpful? Uh, questions, the uh, first one is Representative Bromney. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm on. Uh, thank you. Um, so let's talk about the transfers on the uh, road tolls. So Marie and I kind of understand that they probably have the pumps right by the water and they know that they are of the pumps. Uh, well, again, someone with a, with a boat that has a trailer, they may fill up their tank at a, at a get regular gas station. How do they know, how do they, and, and the same thing with the off-road vehicle, how, how do they know that the gasoline is being sold for that use to be actually used. what what that is is we here at Fish and Game are responsible for sending the Department of Safety Road Toll Bureau the annual report of all registrations sold for OHRV, and they take that figure, say it's eighty five thousand registrations a year. They take that figure and they plug it into a formula on their side based on un unrefunded fuel. And that's how they come up with that figure. Okay, because my understanding is that there is, if, if you have a boat and you fill and you fill your tank, let's say you fill their, your tank up, uh, you can, uh, the individual can apply for a refund of the tax part, right? That's the Absolutely. Whole Right, the same thing with an off-road vehicle. They can. They so can. They're left with, and a lot of people don't. So that's the um, that's the unrefunded unrun part of this, correct? That is correct. Right. So, all right. I, I, I just wasn't sure how that all worked. And you say there's some kind of a formula they use to calculate how much you go back. On on both on both pots of money, it's a formula used for the amount of OHRV registrations that are registered right. annually. Right and the amount of boats that are registered. Yeah. Now, boat registrations, of course, run through the Department of Safety, so that's all done internally. And for all the number of OHRV registrations, that's a figure that we actually send over to them on an annual basis. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. It's a lot of money. It is. Okay, Representative Elmay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd just like to comment on the last one. Maybe we'd like to find out what that formula is and whether they update it every now and then. <laughs> but um, I have a question about the, the, the fact, I think you have more money in the sub funds, the dedicated funds, um, especially the, the, the game licenses other than Moose, um, I believe all have been merged into one fund. There's a fund for, there's a license for a turkey, there's a license for uh, a partridge, I think. There's a license for all sorts of, of, of smaller game uh, and deer and such. Uh, and I think they've all been merged into the same since they're improving the habitat for for one animal, they're usually improving it for others as well. And they use them for that purpose, as I recall. But uh, I wonder for us to try to understand the fish and game revenues, if we really don't need to have some kind of understanding of how much is in those dedicated funds, I have that list right here in front of me. Thank um, you. I, That's great. I, <laughs> I wanted to be completely prepared for all of your questions today. Um, and you are absolutely right about these smaller funds. Many years ago, we had a waterfowl, a turkey, and a bear and moose account, all separate. And it, it 
did not make sense to have all those separate accounts. They were merged into what we call now the game management account. So we have right now on the books 16 dedicated accounts and you're asking specifically for the game management account. I have the balance that was brought forward into fiscal year 21 and that would have been $1.6 million. Thank you. I know, I know this is in our dedicated fund, what I call a telephone book, <laughs> enormous compilation. Um, but what are, what's the total for all of the dedicated accounts? And how, how much comes in from the feds? Oh, I, I don't, well, total federal dollars uh, really varies on an annual basis. It's averages seven to 10 million a year. The unobligated balance that came forward into fiscal year 21, which means when we close the books June 30th of 2020 in our dedicated accounts, meaning, you know, not these funds cannot be used in the unrestricted fish and game fund was 7.2 million. Thank you. You're so in fact, we're looking at about half of, of the expenses that are in fees. I, I would like to go system. on and I would like to go on and say that 1.3 million of that was OHRV. And as we know, um, OHRV is used for certainly law enforcement. And when um, the OHRV funds come in, approximately 72 to 75% of those funds get transferred over to DNCR. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further questions from the committee? Sam Nunn, Kathy, thank you for your presentation. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, Donna Call, is there any chance she might be on the line? He is not yet, Representative Major. I had reached out to um, Dana and uh, Monica and asked them to join the call a little bit early. Um, oh about 10 minutes early of their scheduled time. So we're still 20 minutes ahead of what I'd asked them to do. Um, based on Rep. Almi's question about the Department of Safety and their calculation for the un unrefunded tolls, I did send a question over to Steve Lavoie and Scott Breyer to get a response from them on that. Okay. Multitasking as we're working here today. I am so... <laughs> Except some of my emails aren't going out. I can reach out to Dana and Monica again with an email and see if they could join sooner. But um, you, unless there's something the committee needs to talk about at this moment, uh, I don't know if you want to take a break for a few minutes or. Any questions or comments from the committee? If you don't, we will take a break until 20. Five after. Uh, Norm, Representative yes. Schamberg here. Yes. Are we exacting any bills tomorrow or are we just having hearings tomorrow? Well, I talked with Susan and we plan on exacting. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure I heard you right. And will that be after the hearings or be sometime during? If, if there's time between hearing, then we okay. will hopefully be able to uh, exec a bill too. Okay. We won't have any time and we'll do the exec at the end of the last hearing. Okay. Thank you, sir. But there's only there's only four bills that uh, work on candidates for okay. exacting tomorrow. And I, I can go through those right now. And those are bills that uh, as a result of the Republican caucus and the Democratic caucus uh, pretty close on 
And that would be House Bill 15, House Bill 281, House Bill 353, I mean 333. Uh, what? 353. Yeah, 353. House Bill 583. No, 533. And 533 is an early bill, and we need to get that out tomorrow. So there's one, two, three, four bills. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it was... 15, 281, 353? Let me, House Bill 15, 281, 353, and 533. Thank you. Uh, Norm? Yes. Um, I've been taking notes and I keep going back to Edie's comments about how much COVID is gonna affect these revenues. Um, but it seems like we have some revenues that we don't really think COVID's going to affect very much. And we have others like meals and rooms where there might be a very great effect and may, may, might make sense going forward to kind of break those out. Right. Well, I think you've been on this before. And what we usually end up doing is that we take care of the easy revenues first. Yeah. Those that, uh, such as Tom refers to, that we're pretty confident, don't very much. And we have great confidence in the agencies. And uh, we don't feel that COVID is, and we'll have to identify those that we feel COVID isn't going to affect very much. Um, this, this is why I, I, we need to get somebody from HHS come before the committee and so we can question them relative to where is this COVID going? Do we see light at the end of the tunnel? Is it going to get worse? Is it going to get better? Is it going to reoccur again? That's what we're going. We need their best estimates on that. If we don't do that, if we don't do that with HHS, we're really not doing our job. I agree. Um, any further comments before we take a break? Well, you know, if we could get the link, uh, Mr. Chairman, to that two-hour meeting with... <clears throat> oh, Chris is, going to, Chris is going to send that link to us. Okay, I, I'd be happy to, to look at it this weekend and see whether there's a section that's particularly relevant. Not only you, whoever else will do that. It, it will help the committee as a whole. I think it would be, you know, two hours is a long time. And yes. if the uh, the new people are right at the same point as we are on this COVID, so uh, I invite them to uh, do the same. Great. Representative Major? <laughs> yes, Chris. Um, Dana Call is on the line now, so she could meet with the committee now if you're ready. That would be fine. And I'll reach out to Monica as well, and, and maybe she can join in the middle of the conversation. Uh, Monica is the treasurer, and she would be talking to you about abandoned property if there were any questions. So if there weren't any questions, then she's not needed, but I'll reach out to her. Does um, Dana need to have the screen shared? Um, I don't know. She'd have to tell us. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can, Dana. Do you have anything okay. you want to share on a screen, Dana? No, I'm I'm just available for questions. I don't have anything to present today. The, um, can you put up their handout from the last? Yep. One? And they're going to concentrate on the so-called other revenues. Correct. I went through this presentation um, last time we met, 
so I can follow up with any additional questions. Okay. So I've got it on page three of the presentation um, that just talks about kind of an overview of the different um, other revenue that's tracked and, and collected by DAS and by other agencies. Okay. Uh, let me pull up the participant list. Sorry. Let's see. All right, Representative uh, Southwark, you have a question. Representative Southworth? Yeah, I apologize. My hand was up from before. Okay. Uh, Representative Brunn. Yeah, so this is actually for Chris. Um, what, what percent, I don't have uh, the sheets in front of me, but what percent, uh, we're hearing from, uh, ban from uh, about abandoned property because it's a, it's a large number compared to the rest. What, what percentage of the total is abandoned property on, uh, on the other? Yeah, I think slide six has a good depiction of that. So, so I'm on slide six now and you can see abandoned property is um, estimated to be about 17.3 million in 21, 16.8 million in 22 and 18.4 million in 23. But when we look at the total for, uh, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, okay. that, that so, so the total, the total in the other category, you know, is sixty four point um, eight million of that seventeen point three would be from abandoned property in twenty twenty one. Right, and that's why we're breaking it out just to make sure we get that one, understand that 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 large number compared to the rest of these. Right, but, of, of many yep. of the other. The first miscellaneous revenues. There's about what two hundred. Of dedicated funds there. Yeah, is that the right number? I think Dana said something like 140 now, but it, it has been up closer to 200 in past years. Okay, but Dana, you can correct me. Yeah, yeah they're um, revenue sources in our financial system, so they may or may not be dedicated, but they are various revenue sources collected by the agencies. And that whole 140 represents that 26.7 million. Yes. Yeah. And then the other three are the major items. Reimbursement, indirect costs, post-retirement benefits recovery, and abandoned property. Correct. Those are the top three within the entire category of other. Um, Representative Abrani. Oh no, I, I, I didn't lower my hand, I'm sorry. Okay, Representative Yuri. Jordan. I, I gotta find the thing. Uh, Cause anyway, uh, Chris, could you please share my email address? Uh, I've got a constituent with uh, an issue and a- um, Jordan, I can't hear you. Jordan, can you speak up? How's this, better? Better. Yeah. Chris, could you please share my email address uh, so that I can uh, contact her directly? I have a constituent with an issue regarding uh, unclaimed property and a small thing she should be aware of. Thank you. Okay, Representative Almy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just wanted to ask, there are a number of these that uh, in the other category that are on our boards, gas fitter fees, things like that, um, that are in the larger part of the other category. Are those lapses? Is that the way that one works? Lapse at the end of the year of what the board hasn't had to spend? Um. This would be just on the revenue side, so it would be any revenue they collected that would support the expenditure of that agency. So it doesn't. It this particular rev, these particular revenue sources here are unrestricted revenues that support 
general fund spending as a whole. Uh, so if they if they collect what they planned to collect, we're in good shape. If they collect less than they planned, then our hope is that another revenue source comes in higher and net net the total category comes within plan. Does that answer your question? Yeah, my question comes from on uh, in the past we were looking at the board of electricians which had been absorbed into safety uh, at a time when we had a very long-term commissioner. And on um, plumbers, um, the idea was that electricians should, should go with plumbers. The electricians were very upset about this, partly because uh, some of their expenses were of their fees were being used for things that belong to all of safety and not to them. And they eventually got out of there. But um, do you, do you, when they're they're within another agency and they aren't completely uh, within the the what that that agency is doing? Do you look at how these expenses go, on um, how they are using their expenses, or does anybody do that? Uh, we do not do that here in central accounting, but I'm I'm sure that the Department of Safety would have more information on that. It's one of their revenue sources, so I would I would not speak for them. Any further questions from the committee? Um, Chris, is Monica, or have you been able to contact her yet? Um, I haven't been able to get in touch with her yet. But again, the committee is meeting a little bit sooner than I had originally told her. Okay. So she she may get on by 1120 because Dana was able to, but I don't know. Um, and if there's any specific questions um, for her that the committee doesn't want to stay on the call until she gets on. I, I can share those with her and, and bring it back to the committee. We can wait until she gets on. Um, it, it's however you want to proceed, Representative Major. She, like she may be on in the next five or ten minutes. Oh, we'll wait. Okay. Um, and and if I might, Representative Over, you would just like me to get you the abandoned property <laughs> information and send it to your email. Yeah, I've got a constituent uh, that uh, had an um, interesting conversation with the people on the phone, um, and I wanted to relay that. Okay. Yeah, so I'll get you the treasurer and then the um, director of abandoned properties uh, email addresses, and I'll send them to you. Okay, fine. Thank you. And what we're looking at on the screen now is some of the other unrestricted revenues. Uh, yep. Um, one, one, you see the labor transfer in the middle of the page. So if I can yes. highlight it. Yeah. So that, that's an example of an agency that uh, has a dedicated funding mechanism currently. So all the fees that they collect go into a, 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 a uh, dedicated fund. They pay their expenses from that so that the legislature appropriates them in a budget and it's paid through that fund. And at the end of the year, they transfer any balance that's remaining to the general fund. So that's a, it's a revenue transfer into the other category. So that's one example, um, I think kind of relates to what Representative Almey was asking about like the gas fitters. Gas fitters, I think is set in statute so that they're, they're a generally funded board so all their fees go into the general fund and then they are funded through the general fund and the reviews that you would have for those types of agencies um, by the legislature would be essentially be during this budget um, process so if there's any specific questions on um, a specific fund and how it's being used to pay for um, activities within an agency you know that's a time that sometimes the finance committee will will have that discussion with the agencies. And sometimes as a result of that, you might see language added to House Bill 2 to address some of those concerns. Um, so I would suggest that if there's members of, of House Ways and Means or any other committee that 
um, has a concern about an activity that's funded through the budget that is in a debt using a dedicated or restricted fund, um, share that with your finance um, members and, and they can maybe address that as part of the, the um, budget preparation process. In addition, in addition, our office will sometimes do audits of these various entities. Um, we do performance audits and financial audits. Performance audits are driven by the Legislative Performance Audit Oversight Committee, um, looking more at like your efficiency effectiveness type of issues. And then obviously the financial audits look at the finances. Um, so there's a, those are two ways that somebody outside the agency might look at some of these entities. The, um, there's one line there, the indigent uh, representation. Yep. Uh, uh, FY 2020 actual was 1895. Uh, does this mean that it was funded and this is the excess over that or, or how do so, you, how so that's that? a rec basically a recovery of judicial council okay um, expenses so when they when they pay um, or they pay for the services that are provided for those individuals that can't afford an attorney or the services around that. Um, they do, there's a process within administrative services to look at individuals to see if they could reimburse the state for some portion of that money that they spent on their defense or on their case. Um, so that's what that represents. And that's why it, it's fairly difficult, I think, to, to know exactly what they're going to get from year to year because it's, it's uh, really dependent on what they can recover. That's a fairly large amount. Yeah, 1.8 right. million. Oh, Chris, I was just going to add, that's a great explanation, um, and it's done through our Costa Collections Division here in Admin Services, um, but they did have some recent legislative changes that I think um, restricted the amount that, I, I shouldn't use the term restricted, but um, we, we expect to collect less because of some recent changes in legislation. Right. Yep. So that is, um, Commissioner Arlinghouse had uh, given me a lower estimate for that line item going forward. Thank you, Dana. And I'm sorry, I should have let Dana respond to that. No, I think that was a great response. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Representative Abrami. Uh, I was gonna ask this question, but since we have time, uh, if you go to the aircraft operations fees, uh, I guess it would be Dana, uh, Years ago, we, we had a bill that we actually lowered the fees to encourage more planes to be based in New Hampshire. But does that line also include the uh, fuel tax that we collect from both the uh, prop planes and jet A fuel that's used? I would expect not. I can check with the Department of Transportation unless Chris knows, but we, since we've identified that particular revenue source just for aircraft operator fees, I would expect there wouldn't be other funds commingled in that line. So those are the, those are the aircraft registration fees to, to uh, be based, to have your plane uh, based in New Hampshire, correct? It's like car registration, but it's an airplane yes. registration, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Okay, is Monica? She's not. Representative Major, could I on uh, um, add something to the dedicated fund discussion? Yes. Thank you. Um, I was on the division in finance many, many years ago, which was supposed to be dealing with these things. And uh, I understand that they're still, they pay very little attention to the dedicated funds because they're concentrated on the general fund uh, and the education trust fund. And that is why over the, I worked over the years on dedicated fund uh, oversight for a long time. And we now have a dedicated fund joint committee with the Senate which is doing five-year cycle uh, reviews of all of the dedicated funds by agency. And um, we have in the past um, uh, found say, things, the, the uh, Office for Professional Licensure and Certification had, 
came and asked us for a, uh, told us that they, they, because we were talking with them, they went and asked for a performance audit, which is coming to them shortly. Uh, if anybody does have uh, questions about dedicated funds, I think uh, we are doing a five-year cycle, but we do it, uh, Representative Major, I think he's going to chair again. Uh, I think I'm going to be clerk again. <laughs> Uh, yep. the, uh, the, uh, we, but um, we also take things out of order when we've got questions that have come up so that we can look at particular dedicated funds and see, we, we look at how much money uh, they have accumulated that they aren't using. Uh, that's been a pro what used to be a problem in some of them. We look at whether they've got too little money to do what they're supposed to be doing or they're doing the same thing as something else. Um, it, the, the funds have been getting a lot more regularized over this long period in which we've been looking at them. That'll make tomorrow easier when we discuss uh, House Bill 134, which is repealing the dedicated, dedicated funds. Some dedicated funds. So, Representative Major, uh, the treasurer is on the line now, and she'll be promoted into the call. Okay, great. Um, and just a, a follow up with the dedicated funds. That document is uh, produced by Department of Administrative Services and is available on their website. So you can see the, uh, as Representative Almi referred to it as the phone book, um, electronically on on Department of Administrative Services website. And you'll see all the dedicated funds that are. Um, established in the state. Um, it does provide the statutory reference. So if you're curious as to, you know, how it's set up and, and what the law is saying. Um, and to the comment about the um, finance committee, maybe not looking as much at the dedicated funds as they do the general fund and the education trust fund, as well as um, fishing game and, and highway funds with unrestricted. Um, th that's a true statement, uh, partly because a lot of the dedicated funds provide authority to the commissioner or a commission or group to um, appropriate and spend the money in those dedicated funds. So, so the legislature through the legislation has decided that, you know, the money should be available for a certain purpose and, and um, they come forward and present it in their budget. And they may have a, a language that allows them to, if they have more revenue than they expected to just go ahead and budget that for the activity. Um, so that, to, to the, so that kind of led to the purpose, I think, of the, the commission that she was talking about just a moment ago to review the dedicated funds, to make sure they were being used um, the way that the legislature intended, uh, make sure that, you know, over time things haven't changed where the funds maybe need to be used differently. And if that was the case, then a legislation could be introduced um, to reflect what the use of the funds should be going forward. And then if the fund wasn't being used to repeal it and, um, clean it up a little bit. And so when you look at the dedicated fund report, you'll see that there's some, they're all numbered starting at one and they go up to like 350 now, so somewhere in that range. But you'll see, you know, some numbers are repealed. Um, purposely, the, the numbers aren't reused. It, it, you just keep adding to the end as you create a new fund. So um, I think partly for historical reason and not to confuse the any any history that might be traced. So based on that, um, and now that Monica's in the meeting, um, I'll, I'll be quiet. And if there's any questions you have specific to abandoned property or anything else the treasurer um, does with interest in surplus or, or any other functions, uh, I'm sure she'd be happy to discuss that with you. Does she have a screen that she wants to share with us? Monica, do you have anything you want to share or you're just going to respond to questions from the committee? Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. And um, Mr. Chairman, thanks again for, for the invitation to be here. I, I don't have anything to, to present to you today. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Um, I'm very sorry, I just, I just joined the meeting, so um, um, I had a different commitment. Um, but, uh, but if you want to, um, um, if you, I know you're reviewing the estimates that we provided. Um, what I can briefly say, I think. Um, two weeks ago, when I when I was um, um, in this meeting um, meeting um, with with all of you, um, 
you know, I, I mentioned that the estimates that we provide are really based on a 10 year average that we calculate. Um, so that's, so those are the numbers that, you know, this, this methodology that we use, uh, the 10 year average produces. Um, and so um, when we calculate this estimate, it really is, um, I mentioned, I mentioned the past. So th after three years, when we, we, we were, we were able to return um, funds to, to the rightful owners, um, then we have this property that we're able to escheat to the counties and the general fund. And so we use um, the, the components of the calculation that I shared with you two weeks ago. Um, you know, we use those components that are more consistent year to year, things that we know, um, the, 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 the property that is reported to us, an average of um, what we pay each, you know, during the last 10 years, an average of what we pay. And so the only component that is difficult to estimate is, is the value of um, the, the amount of proceeds that we're gonna receive when we sell securities. So that's really the only one that really will perhaps drive the number that we provide either higher or lower, depending on you know, how the fair market value of those securities is gonna be at the time that we, um, that we sell those securities. So that really is a foundation of how we come up with those numbers. The, the, so that's what we have. And then once we start selling securities, which will start, um, I will say in about a month, that's when we start that process uh, we don't typically recalculate the estimate because we really still don't have any changes. So it's really until June when we, we, when we might have a better idea if the number that we are estimating is going to change. Um, so so, so that's, that's really what I can share with you. I'll be happy to answer any questions that, that you may have. Um, Roxanne Brownlee. Oh. <laughs> Again, I, I forgot to lower my hand from before. I'm sorry. Um, let me ask you a question, Monica. Where we have pandemic going on and um, we have the death rate in New Hampshire, we're a lot better off than other states. But I would assume there'd be more abandoned property down the road because of the pandemic. Have you accounted for, for this? Yeah, that, that is a great question. I think, um, you know, you know, when we, when we, when we met with, with the committee uh, two weeks ago, we, we kind of have an idea of some of the trends that might change the amount of property that we will get um, or how the industry might change, um, you know, during the next, few years, but the pandemic is not one of them. So I think it will be, um, you know, kind of a similar mm -hmm. effort, depending on how soon um, um, holders report to us a type of property, perhaps that will drive the property reported. But some of the changes that we also make in the way we, um, you know, we now, um, you know, claimants can, can claim their funds, so there's some changes that could occur the other way. So we may get more funds reported to us, but then we may have uh, more individuals claiming property since they have more access to computers in their home. And, and so they're able to search for property uh, more than, than others. So it's a great question. So I, I think to answer you, your question is, that has not been uh, included in this estimate. Um, this estimate is really strictly based on the information that we've that we have uh, during that has occurred over the last ten years, um, based on the property that has been reported to us three years ago, um, and and so that's that's what we're presenting today. It, it is really a better estimate, I think, um, just because we're consistent with the methodology, and I think most of the times. Um, it doesn't change that much. It did change last year again because of the unknown variable of securities, how the, the fair market value of those securities is going to change. That really is what could drive 
um, a significant change if the market were to change. Right now, it doesn't appear that it's happening. Um, you know, we could have some adjustments, some some um, corrections in the capital market in the coming months, but it is it's it wouldn't be um, is not anticipated to be a, a, a great a, right now. Of course, we don't know. Um, we can't time the market and all of that, but uh, it's not anticipated to be a, a very big adjustment like we the one we had last year as a result of the pandemic. Okay, Representative Almey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Monica, I think I started on this question last time, but the issue of when securities are sold, or maybe we discussed it before, on there are at least some brokerages that in order to avoid timing the market and losing on sell or buy over a longer period of time. And I wonder if the selling process is complicated enough that you couldn't institute something like that. So right now, if we get the wrong day, all these people lose. And if we get a beautiful day, they win. Right, no, and, and that is a great question. I actually, when I had an opportunity to, to speak to Mr. McAnaspy about this, um, you know, we just explore your question, your exact question. And, and so, um, he reminded me of um, really how this process uh, works. It's not a one day transaction. It doesn't happen you know, in one day. It really the process, and this is the custodian that does it uh, for us. Um, they start um, selling, um, I, think, I think they start around March time and it takes a couple of months, it takes a few months to, um, to really do that. So they start selling, they start, there's done, um, you know, that process. And so for us, when we receive the proceeds, we receive the proceeds, um, I think sometime in May, when we start receiving some payments from that, from those, um, you know, from those sales. And um, so it is not, it doesn't happen in one day. It does happen over time. Um, it, so, so it was last year, it really was during those bad months because as you know, the markets recovered in May. We were back, you know, they were back to normal in May, um, June, the market was up again. So it really was just a very bad timing uh, last year. So again, unless we have the same, the same bad timing this year, uh, of which I don't anticipate, um, I hope I don't have to come back to you and say, I'm so sorry about this for my bad, my bad estimates. Um, <clears throat> But we really don't anticipate it, so it really is a, a process that takes longer. And we couldn't we couldn't sell every month. Like it really, we really need to wait until this property meets that period of, um, you know, meets the requirement. Of, okay, we haven't returned this funds, um, and and so securities is for one year. So we need to hold those securities for that whole period, the whole one year period, in order for us to be able to sell it. So. Um, the way we, the way it is established today, uh, we we couldn't start selling, you know, month after month. We will have to probably change our process significantly to to do something like that. Any further questions for Monica? Representative Major. Yes. Just, just for the committee's. Um, just for information for the committee, Monica, the, the transfer occurs in June related to abandoned property revenue, correct? That is correct. So that, that, that it's, it's a, an end of the year um, activity that occurs. So just so the committee knows, there's no uh, monthly or quarterly estimates go along with this. It's, it's um, the treasurer is trying to estimate for, for year end what they think they might transfer. And, and I think what Monica has um, alluded to is that you know, there, there could be factors between now and June that um, may impact the estimate to some extent. Exactly, and and so that's the reason why our our estimates really don't change. We we have our best estimate, but there's really not a lot we can change from now until the actual calculation happens. And um, it's just because we do have to wait for 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 the you know to meet the the requirements of the property, and that's what we we try to calculate it as soon as we can. So it does happen. Um, some, you know, mid June. So we're able to, uh, you know, um, 
So we are able to submit all of the funding, um, the, the, this treatment revenue to the general fund before the end of the year, before June 30. So um, I know our ministerial services they're asking us about you, 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 you know, uh, the beginning of June is, is do you still expect uh, the amount coming on time? And we always say yes, but, but we know there's, you know, that anticipation of our revenue um, um, expected before the end of the year. Any further comments or questions from the committee? Monica, thank you again. Okay. My pleasure. Thanks again for the invitation. Okay. Happy to answer any questions if, if you have any um, after this. Okay. Thank you. Um, for the committee, uh, we're through of our revenues for this morning. And remind you that we have our public hearings, <coughs> seven bills tomorrow. And we we're gonna to try to uh, reject four bills that we had heard previously. I had sent an email, an email out to the Republican members about the caucus today at four. If you didn't get that email, would you either call me or send me an email? So I can resend the link to you. Does anybody else have any other comments before we close? Mr. Chairman, I'd just oh. like to let you know that uh, the Democratic Caucus is meeting on Saturday afternoons now. It seemed to be the best time for everybody. Oh, Saturday afternoon. Wow. Good for you. Oops, I, 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 whatever. No. We, uh, Representative Almy. I mean, uh, uh, Bromley. So uh, you said that uh, it, the tomorrow is still up in the air a little bit. Uh, uh, but how are you going to, you're going to communicate if it's going to be a total uh, virtual meeting and not in person? Is that it? Or, or, are, you, or are you going at making the call right now that? Uh, as, well, as of this point, it's a um, uh, hybrid meeting because I do not have confirmation otherwise. So is that, gonna, is that a firm, is that, is that gonna potentially change? Uh, and if it does, I'm assuming- If it changes, we'll send out an, uh, an email to the full committee. All right, so the committee should be looking for an email. Um, right. Okay, thank you. And personally, I would like to have it change, but uh, so, Still, if it doesn't change, I will be there. I hope not many others will be. But, uh, and I'll try to be as loud as I can. All right, anything else? Then for the Republicans, we're going to be meeting at four. And I guess we also have another caucus at six, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> caucus the whole day. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.